Thanks very much, everybody. So here, here are the cliff notes of my talk. Nature's in trouble, which means we're in trouble, but there is hope. That's it. That's the cliff notes. So we'll get to it now. <laughs> what my idea of nature's best hope is, but first we have to talk about uh, the book that Edward O. Wilson, E.O. Wilson from Harvard, wrote in 2016 called Half Earth, Our Planet's Fight for Life. Of course, he has uh, had a remarkably productive career, uh, probably the most impactful biologist of our time. Uh, and he writes a book every year. He's 92 now, still writes a book every year. So Half Earth was his 2016 book, but it, it followed a theme that he has been uh, active in his entire career, and that is trying to save biodiversity on planet, planet Earth. So in this book, he said, in order to save all of life or any life on planet Earth, we have to allocate at least half of the planet for nature. If we don't do that, we're going to lose life everywhere. And then he spent most of the book talking about the science that supports that statement. So people who are, are very much into conservation said, well, that's a, that's a wonderful idea, but even very knowledgeable people are scratching their heads. How can we possibly save half of the earth for nature? Half of the earth is already in some form of agriculture and 7.8, 7.9 billion of us are stuffed in the other half along with all of our infrastructure and our detritus and all of that stuff. And there is no third half to put aside for, for nature. So how could we do this? Well, that's what I want to talk about today. I think we can realize EO's dream, but we're going to need a new approach to conservation. Back in 2019, we had what we call an oak mast, where members of the red oak group got together and decided to make their acorns at the same time. And this is what it looked like over much of the eastern part of the US. Well, I'm easily entertained. So I took one of those acorns and I just stared at it. Uh, and I was rewarded because an insect started to chew its way out of the acorn. First, it chewed a little hole for its head. It stepped its head through there. Then it stepped its entire body through that hole. It was a tight squeeze. Looked like the Pillsbury Doughboy. Finally, it plopped down. That's a dangerous time for this insect larva because it's good to eat. A lot of things are after it. So it wiggles and squirms its way underground in about 30 seconds. And once it's underground, it stretches in all directions and forms a chamber. And within that chamber converts itself to a pupa. And then it stays there for two years. After two years, comes out as an acorn weevil. That's what an acorn weevil looks like. A lot of people think weevils have big noses because it looks like they do, but that's actually an extension of the head capsule. And the mouth parts are way down here at the end of that extension. And they take those mouth parts and chew a hole into the center of the acorn, turn around and lay an egg in that hole. And that's how the larva gets down there. You might wonder why they spend two years underground before they emerge as an adult. Why don't they come out the very next year? And the answer is it takes red oak acorns 18 months to complete their development. So if they came out the very next year, there wouldn't be enough acorns for them. Of course, once they have left the acorn, it leaves a hole, a true vacuum. And you know that nature abhors a vacuum. And in this case, she has filled it with three species of Temnothorax ants, tiny little ants where the entire colony lives in the holes made by acorn weevils. And if scouts find a new hole in a new acorn, they get excited because their old acorn is falling apart. So they tell everybody it's time to move. So they move the, the larvae, they move the eggs, the whole colony moves into the new egg corn in about 30 minutes. Then they post a guard here to make sure nobody else comes in. And that's where they'll live for the next two years until this egg corn starts to fall apart. What's my point? Uh, very simply, that is just one of literally millions of very specialized interactions between animals and plants that comprise the bulk of nature. This is another one, the relationship between jays and, and acorns. Jays are the primary disperser of, of oak acorns. Uh, another one here, this is uh, pileated woodpeckers have a specialized relationship with, uh, with um, carpenter ants. That's what they feed their young. So you won't have pileated woodpeckers unless you have lots of carpenter ants and you won't have lots of carpenter ants unless you have the big trees that make those carpenter ants. You won't have this bee, Andrena faciliae, unless you have facilia. That's the only pollen that that bee can rear its young on. And it turns out that pollen specialization is very common in our native bees. We have about 4,000 species of native bees and over a third of them are highly specialized on particular pollens. You won't have the Baltimore checker spot without white turtle head. I could talk about nature specialized relationships all week long. The point I wanna make though, is that these specialized relationships, nature itself is on the ropes. And it's on the ropes because we did not take Teddy Roosevelt's advice. Way back in 1908, Teddy heard that the state of Arizona was going to mine the Grand Canyon. So he went to the canyon, looked out over its beautiful scenery, and he said, leave it as it is. 
And with those five words, he started the process of creating the Grand Canyon National Park. Well, we didn't do that. We didn't leave the country as it was. Um, there's only about 5% of the lower 48 states. It's anything close to its original pristine ecological condition. And that's because we have logged the country repeatedly. We have tilled it. We have drained it. We have grazed it. We get 770 million acres of rangeland. So, uh, it's four and a half times the size of Texas uh, dedicated to cows. And of course, we paved it or otherwise developed it. We have straightened our rivers and dammed them. And you can spell that any way you want. We have polluted our skies and changed our climate for centuries to come. We've drained our aquifers. We've introduced more than 3,300 species of plants from other continents, those invasive species that, that uh, Kay was talking about. And many of them are running amok in our natural areas. In short, we have carved up those natural areas into tiny remnants of their former selves. And each one of those remnants is too small and too isolated to sustain the species, the amount of nature, that we need to run the ecosystems that sustain us. You might wonder why we, we've done this. I wonder why we've done this. Um, not sure, but I, I suspect we thought that, that our nest, planet Earth, was so large, we could follow it forever and there wouldn't be any consequences. Of course, we were wrong about that. And that's why we're seeing some pretty scary headlines at a regular clip. Like this one, the insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? Talking about global insect decline. Followed by this one. North America has lost 3 billion breeding birds in the last 50 years, almost a third of our North American bird population already gone. And now the UN says, well, we're, we're slated to lose a million species to extinction uh, probably in the next 20 years. I don't know if you, if you heard, but three weeks ago, we removed 23 species from the endangered species list and we removed them because they're already extinct. This, by the way, is not an option, folks. It is not an option for us to lose a million species. These are the species that keep us alive on planet Earth. So I could go on talking about the, the pox that we humans have delivered upon the environment, thus upon all of our, our houses. But that's what this talk is about. This talk is about a cure for that pox. It's a cure that'll take small efforts from a lot of people, but those efforts will deliver enormous physical, psychological, and environmental benefits to everybody. To return briefly to this headline, the insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? Well, back to E.O. Wilson. He told us what it would mean if we lost insects, and he did it way back in 1987 with this paper, The Little Things That Run the World. And his message was clear. Life as we know it depends on insects. If we were to lose insects, we'd lose most of our flowering plants. And if we lost most of our flowering plants, that would so drastically change energy flow through our terrestrial ecosystems that the food webs that support our animals, the amphibians, the reptiles, the birds, the mammals, even many of our freshwater fish, those food webs would disappear. They would collapse and so would all of those animals disappear. The biosphere, the living portion of the earth would rot because we would have lost insect decomposers that right now rapidly turn over nutrients and all we would have is, is uh, bacteria and fungi. And of course, humans wouldn't survive any of those drastic changes. There is some good news here, and that is that none of that has to happen. We can save our insects, we can save our birds, we can save nature itself. But we're going to have to change the way we landscape in order to do it, and we're going to have to change the way we landscape pretty soon. Why is that? Well, remember, humans are products of nature. We are totally dependent on, on the life support systems that, that ecosystems deliver to us. We call them ecosystem services. Here's some of the things that, that plants do, not just for us, but for everything else on the planet, like produce oxygen, pretty important, clean our water. When it rains, that water you know, it makes its way to the sea where it's too salty to use. Well, plants slow down that journey. Carbon capture, enormously important today. Plants are taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere building their tissues out of that carbon, and then pumping the extra carbon into the ground for long-term storage. Our soils are brown or black, back black because of the carbon that plant roots have deposited there over the, over the eons. Plants are building topsoil and holding it in place. They're preventing floods. They're dampening severe weather, converting sunlight to food. You know, if we didn't have plants, we'd have to eat sunlight, and that would be difficult. Uh, what do animals do for plants? They provide pest control services. They pollinate nearly 90% of our flowering plants. They disperse plant seeds. So designing landscapes like this that destroy the production of ecosystem services is just not a good idea. Never was a good idea, but today it's a terrible idea because we need more ecosystem services today than ever before. 
Instead, the way we're designing uh, landscapes around the world, we're getting fewer and fewer. There have been visionaries through the ages who have recognized that we humans needed to work on our relationship with planet Earth, and Aldo Leopold was one of the most eloquent. He wrote extensively in the first half of the 1900s. And one of the things he said is the oldest task in human history is to live in a piece of land without spoiling it. Now, there have been indigenous groups who have been good at, at doing that for long periods, but our huge Western societies and our huge Asian societies are terrible at doing that. We habitually take more from the earth than it has to offer, completely wrecking an area, then going to another area, doing the same thing, not sustainable behavior. But Aldo had a lot of faith in humans. He believed we could develop what he called the land ethic. He had, he had this dream that we would, we would learn to use the earth. We, he knew we had to use the earth. We had to farm and lumber and graze and mine and do all those things. But he dreamt that we could learn to use it gently enough that we did not destroy local ecosystems. And that's what he called a land ethic. And he wrote about it in the Sand County Almanac. What he never talked about, though, is developing a land ethic where we actually lived. And I'm not sure where that, why that was, but I suspect the notion that humans and nature cannot coexist in the same, same place at the same time. That notion was so deeply embedded in the culture of Aldo Leopold's day, still embedded in our, our own culture, that he may not have recognized it as an option. But what I wanna to argue today is that not only is living with nature an option, it is now the only viable option that's left to us. In the past, of course, conservationists worked pretty much exclusively where there weren't a lot of people. We now need to turn that on its head we need to save nature, actually reconstruct it where we've destroyed it, where there are a lot of people, because that's pretty much everywhere. In other words, we have to find ways for nature to thrive in human-dominated landscapes, not hang on by a thread, but thrive. Where should we start? Well, let's go back to private property. We cannot ignore private property. If we don't do conservation on private property, we're going to fail because most of the land is privately owned. 85.6% of the U.S. east of the Mississippi is privately owned. 98% of Texas is privately owned. 78% of the entire country is privately owned. We cannot ignore these, these private spaces because if we're only working in areas that are protected, um, then we're working in areas that are too small, too isolated, and too few to succeed. Now, when I talk about, about conservation, I'm not using the word correctly. I'm not talking about conserving nature that's not already destroyed. I'm talking about putting it back together again. Uh, and and we, we, wanted, we want to do that everywhere. But in order to do that, we have to start with the building blocks. Not all species contribute to ecosystem function equally. So we have to start with the most important species. And there are a couple of groups that we can't do without, like the flowering plants, Plants, of course, are capturing energy from the, the sun and turning it into food through photosynthesis and storing it in their, their parts. And we need the pollinators that allow those plants to reproduce. So now we have the sun in plant parts. Uh, but in order to support, support the animals that are helping to run our ecosystems, we got to get that energy from plants to those animals. Most vertebrates do not eat plants directly. Most vertebrates eat invertebrates that ate the plants, and it turns out that caterpillars are essential in terms of sustaining the food webs that support those vertebrates. And that's because caterpillars are transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. So if we design landscapes that don't have a lot of caterpillars in them, um, we're, we're going to fail. Let me give you an example from the Carolina chickadee. That's the chickadee that we have down here in Southeast Pennsylvania. You have the black cap chickadee up in New York, pretty much the same bird. Uh, they are the birds that are our feeders right now eating seeds. So we tend to think that's all they need. Well, 50% of their diet during the winter is seeds, but the other 50% is insects and spiders. And when they are reproducing, their babies can't eat seeds at all. So they, uh, they switch 100% to insects and spiders. And if they're in a healthy environment, they will rear their young exclusively on caterpillars. And it turns out that chickadees are not exceptions. 96% of the terrestrial birds in North America rear their young on insects, and most of those insects are caterpillars. How do I know that? There's a number of lines of evidence that suggest that, but this is a citizen science project that my, uh, one of my grad students did a few years ago, Ashley Kennedy. She put out a call for bird photographers across the country to take pictures of, of birds during the breeding season when they were carrying food to the nest. And they were supposed to send those pictures to Ashley. She was going to identify what the prey items were in the beaks of those birds. 
uh, and reconstruct the nestling diet for as many species of birds as possible on, uh, in North America. And this is a summary of her results. The green bars are the percentage of the nestling diet in these different bird families. That was caterpillars. And it's 16 out of the 20 common bird families, caterpillars dominated the diet. So if we design landscapes that don't have enough caterpillars in them, we're not going to be able, we're going we're to lose an awful lot of breeding birds. So there's something special about caterpillars that birds really like. What is it? There's actually several things special about caterpillars. And one of them is that uh, they're soft. So think of this guy as if he's a little sausage with a very thin wrapper. Um, the thin wrapper is, is exoskeleton. It's cuticle. It's made of chitin. Undigestible. Birds don't want a lot of that. Uh, and because they're soft, you can, you can stuff the, the caterpillar down the throat of your offspring without fear of, of injuring it. And if you've ever watched a parent bird rear their young, they're, they're pretty rough. Uh, their beak is like a plunger. They just stuff it down there. Caterpillars are also relatively large prey items. One medium-sized caterpillar is equal to the biomass of 200 aphids. Now, some of our, our birds do chase aphids around, but do you want to chase 200 aphids or get one caterpillar? They're nutritious, they're high in fat, high in protein, low percentage of chitin of exoskeleton compared to many other insects, particularly beetles. Beetles are not like little sausages, they're like little tanks. So much of a beetle is undigestible and many beetles have very sharp edges too. And then finally, caterpillars are the best source of carotenoids for birds during the breeding season. Now I mentioned carotenoids, not because I love organic chemistry, but because I'm a vertebrate and you're a vertebrate. And birds are vertebrates, and we vertebrates cannot make our own carotenoids. Only plants make carotenoids, so we have to get our carotenoids from plants. And we have to get them from plants because carotenoids are essential components of vertebrate diets. Where are the birds getting their carotenoids from? From, from those invertebrates that they eat. But look, carotenoid content is not equally distributed among bird prey items. These first two bars here are types of, of caterpillars, and they have uh, far more carotenoids than, than uh, other bird prey because they're eating the green leaves. That's where the carotenoids are. Much more than the adult caterpillars, the moths and butterflies, which are not eating the green leaves. And here's the earthworm way down here. So the early bird gets the worm, but he doesn't get any carotenoids when he gets the worm. So that study and, and several others actually are suggesting that caterpillars are not optional parts of bird diets. They are essential parts of bird diets. So let's just say birds need caterpillars. The next question is how many caterpillars do they need? Is one or two enough or one or two a day enough? Well, let's go back to chickadees. There's a lot of data on chickadees. How many caterpillars does it take to make a clutch of chickadees? One or two is not enough. One or two a day is not enough. It takes thousands of caterpillars, 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to get one clutch of chickadees to the point where they leave the nest, depending on the number of chicks in the nest. And after they leave the nest, um, they, parents continue to feed them caterpillars another 21 days. So you're talking about really tens of thousands of caterpillars to get one clutch of a bird that weighs a third of an ounce, that's four pennies worth of bird, to the point where they can be independent. Uh, and if you want, uh, chickadees to breed in your yard, you've got to have all those caterpillars in your yard because chickadees don't fly five miles down the, the road to the nearest woodlot. They forage about 50 meters from the nest. And if we design landscapes that don't have all those caterpillars, that's called insect decline. And it's really looking like insect decline is one of the primary drivers of the bird declines that we're seeing around the country. We went to the original data set from Rosenberg et al. They're the group that said, uh, the Smithsonian group that said, we've lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. And we divided the terrestrial bird species into two groups, the groups that, the, the species that require insects at some part of their life history, and the species that don't require insects, like uh, doves and finches that can actually reproduce on, on seeds. They make a little milk out of the seeds and feed that to their young. Well, that group, the one that doesn't require insects, didn't lose any numbers at all in the last 50 years. But the group that requires insects lost on average 10 million individuals per species. Well, it doesn't prove cause and effect, but it certainly is suggestive that as you take bird food away, you lose the birds. Which means we need a new, a new goal uh, when we're thinking about landscapes. In the past, our goal has been um, singular. It's, we want to make pretty landscapes. Uh, we, you know, we had this idea that, that nature was someplace else and we didn't have to coexist with it at all. So we just wanted pretty landscapes. Today, though, there is no, nature is not someplace else. We need to start to live with it. So we need to design landscapes that are pretty and ecologically functional. In other words, they've got to make caterpillars. 
So how do we do that? Well, you add caterpillars to your landscapes by adding the plants that support those caterpillars. And that seems pretty, pretty easy. Uh, but there is a catch, and that is that most plants don't support a lot of caterpillars. So we have to be fussy about which ones we choose for our landscapes. And we have to be fussy about it because the caterpillars themselves are fussy. And the monarch butterfly illustrates that perfectly. You can have all the crepe myrtle and all the boxwood and all the hostas and all of the Bradford pears and, and ginkgos and all the plants that we, we typically decorate our yards with from Asia, and you won't make a single monarch butterfly. The only thing that's going to make a monarch butterfly is milkweeds. That's called host plant specialization. Uh, and it turns out that most of the insects that eat plants are host plant specialists. Why? Because plants have made them that way. Plants don't want to be eaten. They want to, want to capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they've loaded their leaves with nasty tasting chemicals. Secondary metabolic compounds that make those leaves either bitter or downright toxic. And it's a really effective defense. It keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world, which is why it's green in the summertime. It's not because there's no insects out there that want to eat those plants. It's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat most of the plants. They are too well protected. But we do know that insects eat plants. So how do they do that? How do they get around those chemical defenses? Well, this is where the specialization comes in. 90% of the insects that eat plants can only eat uh, the plant lineages for which they have specialized adaptations to get around those chemical defenses. Every plant lineage that's out there protects itself with a unique cocktail of chemical defenses. And an insect can't adapt to all of those, those plant lineages. So it picks one or two that uh, are very similar in how they protect themselves and develops specialized adaptations. Uh, for example, specialized enzymes that store and excrete and detoxify those compounds, behavioral adaptations and life history adaptations that allow the insect to avoid those, those uh, compounds in time and space. But it does take a long period of exposure to those plant lineages for all those adaptations to, to fall into place. And once they do fall into place, the insect's locked in, into eating that, that plant. So if you take uh, the milkweed out of your yard and replace it with hosta, the monarch's not going to start to eat hosta. It's locked into eating milkweed, and the only option is to disappear. Which is why when we bring in plants from other continents, and what more than 80% of our typical landscapes are filled with plants primarily from China in this part of the world, uh, then we're loading the landscapes with, with uh, plants that insects can't use. And when they escape and become invasive species, uh, and, and many of them have, then we're loading our natural areas with plants that our insects can't eat. And then we have insect decline and we get ecosystem collapse. So all I'm trying to say here is that plant choice matters. If we're trying to rebuild the food webs that support the ecosystems that support us, we're going to have to be very careful about which chance we, we, which plants we choose to do that. And I'm going to give you three examples of how well it works when we do choose plants carefully starting with uh, our house right here in Oxford, Pennsylvania. Um, this is what it looked like when, when my wife Cindy and I moved in. Uh, this was a farm that was broken up into 10 acre lots. It had been mowed for hay before that. A very old farm had been farmed for, for 300 plus years. Um, so there were very, very little there when we moved in. And our goal was to restore the food beds, restore the biodiversity on this piece of property. Well, in order to do that, you have to build those, those caterpillar based food webs. Uh, so uh, this is how it worked. For example, I wanted to see if I could attract the Canadian owlet to, to my yard. That's what a Canadian owlet looks like. I've never even seen a Canadian owlet. That's what the adult looks like, just like a leaf. Well, in order to have Canadian owlets, you have to have meadow rue. That is the only plant that can eat host plant specialization. And of course, we didn't have any, any meadow rue. There's no meadow rue anywhere around here. It had been farmed out uh, really centuries ago. So I got some meadow seeds from some, some place, planted them, grew very nicely. But this was early on, and I had very little faith that, that Canadian Alice would be able to find my little patch of meadow roo. So I didn't even go out and, and check it for about two months. But after two months, I walked by for another reason, and there were Canadian Alice all, all over my meadow roo. They had found it right away. I'm still surprised about that. But now I've got a good population of meadow roo and Canadian Alice on our property. So I've added two species. Same story with the goldenrod stowaway. That's a misnomer, by the way. This beautiful moth has nothing to do with goldenrod. It is a specialist on 
this plant, ditch daisy, Biden's Aristosa. I did know where there was some Biden's in a power line cut about 14 miles away. So I got some Biden seeds and I planted them. And again, they grew very nicely. Well, it took about a year for that, that moth to find my Biden's. But it did after a year, and now I've got a good population of both the Bidens and uh, the goldenrod stoic. So now we've added four species to the property. One of the hackberry emperor, not because it's the most beautiful butterfly in the world, but because um, it belongs here. It's one of the species that, that ought to be here. Well, like its name suggests, it's a specialist on hackberry, on celtus, and we didn't have any hackberry, so I planted it. I had to wait four years for the butterflies to find my hackberry, but they did. I checked uh, one of the branches of one of my hackberry trees in June. There were nine hackberry emperor caterpillars on a single branch. So now we've added six species, and that's how it went. I did not plant goldenrod. It came in on its own, and along with it came many of the species that depend on goldenrod, like the beautiful brown hooded owlet, the arcidura flower moth, the goldenrod leaf miner, the distinct sparagonothus, the goldenrod gall moth, now, this is one that hasn't come, the goldenrod flower moth. Um, and that's what its caterpillars look like. I don't know why it hasn't found our, our goldenrod, but it, but it hasn't. But this is, this is part of the fun. This is, this is anticipation. It's like waiting for the ketchup to come out of the bottle. Every year I go out and I check my goldenrod. Uh, and one, you know, one of these years I'm going to find this caterpillar, and that will be a good year. I planted Virginia creeper. Yes, Virginia creeper. Yeah, a lot of people don't like Virginia creeper. I just don't know why. It's a great native. It's got good fall color. It's a good ground cover. It can climb our trees without girdling them, without pulling them down. Uh, it makes very nutritious berries for the birds in the fall. It's a great pollinator plant. Even though the flowers are small and inconspicuous, the, the native bees love it. Remember, when you're making a pollinator garden, you're making it for the bees. Um, but I planted it because it's the primary host plant of the big sphinx moths that are the primary uh, components of the nestling diet of cardinals, things like the Pandora sphinx and its beautiful adult, the lettered sphinx, the hog sphinx, the abbot sphinx, all on Virginia creeper. I want to see if I get the double tooth prominent at our, our house, just because it's such a cool looking caterpillar. I mean, even if you don't like caterpillars, you gotta, you gotta love this guy. It's a specialist on elm, particularly American elm. Uh, we didn't have any elms because the Dutch elm disease took out the elms a long time ago. But there were a couple of, there still are, a couple of big elm trees at the University of Delaware that make seed every year. And I scooped up some seeds and I planted them at home. Uh, there was, those trees are now 80 feet tall. They grew very nicely. And they attracted the double tooth prominent right away. American elm. One of the evening primrose moth because it's beautiful. I like beauty like any, anybody else. Well, believe it or not, we didn't have any evening primrose, so I planted that. The moth came, spends the day with its head stuffed in, in the flowers. It's very cute. And I planted lots of oaks. Now, those are just examples of the plant lineages I put back on our property, but I want to focus on oaks for a while because um, they're such important plants. This is the Bedford oak in Bedford, New York. People argue about whether it's 400 years old or 500 years old. It's enormous. And I hear people say, I'm not going to plant an oak because I won't live long enough to enjoy it. And if you can only enjoy your oaks when they're 400 years old, you're right, you won't. But if you can enjoy what your oaks are contributing to your, your landscape, you can enjoy them immediately. And I can say that with confidence because I planted my oaks as acorns. Most of them as acorns, which means they were free, or a few of them as two foot bare root whips, which means they cost $1.50 each. And immediately they started to rebuild the, the moth-based food web. Remember, moths are transferring all that energy to animals. Um, the very first year, they attracted things like the solitary oak leaf miner, juvenile's dusky wing, the yellow shouldered moth, uh, Suzuki's promolactus, the red wash caterpillar, the yellow vested moth, the orange tufted oneida, the spiny oak caterpillar, the two spotted oak punky, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red humped oak worm, the orange humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm, the hesitant dagger moth, lesser oak dagger moth, greater oak dagger moth, the streaked dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the crown eucalyptus, the orange patch smoky wing, the uh, white blotched heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the red line panopoda, the laugher, and literally hundreds more species of moths have come to the oaks at my house and they come right away. This is a pin oak that has just popped its head above the leaves and here's a caterpillar standing on the ground eating the leaves of that plant. So immediately they start to transfer their energy to the life around you. 
This is what our house looks like today, or actually a few weeks ago. The leaves are falling now. I show you this to convince you we're we're very traditional here. We've got we've got some long, but I put a lot of plants back. And four years ago, I decided to make it a goal to take a picture of every species of moth that is now making a living at our house. Uh, and I'm still at it, but I'm up to 1,140 species of moths. Haven't gotten to the butterflies yet. Now we've got 10 acres. Pennsylvania is 2.4 million acres. So in one 240 thousandths of the land mass, we're supporting 44% of all the moths that occur in the entire state. And because so many of these species are types of bird food, we have recorded 60 species of birds that have bred on our 10 acres. Not flew by, but bred. Why am I telling you this? Well, this is another headline that we saw last year. The World Wildlife Fund says that Earth has lost two thirds of its wildlife since 1970. But I'm thinking, not at our house. I am convinced we have increased biodiversity by more than two thirds and it didn't take that long and it wasn't very hard. All we did was put the plants back. So when you see these, these you know, really disastrous headlines, don't give up get mad, do something, put those plants back and we can turn this around. But I know what you're thinking. We've got 10, 10 acres and a lot of people don't. So what about uh, smaller lots in suburbia? Will it work there? That is a good question. So let's go to Margie and Dan Terpstra's house in Kirkwood, Missouri. They have 0.6 acres, which is 18 times less land than Cindy and I have. Uh, and they live right in the middle of suburbia, everybody with their, their big lawns. So uh, the first thing they did was get rid of their major invasive species, which was Amur honeysuckle, bush honeysuckle. And they put in 75 species of native plants and a water feature they, they uh, call a bubbler. And then they sat back and started to count the birds that are using their, their yard. And they're up to 149 bird species, including 35 warbler species. So just to put that in perspective, uh, we've, we've only recorded eight warbler species at, at our house. So does it work on smaller properties? Absolutely. How about urban yards? The, let's go to Pam Carlson's house in Chicago. And I mean in Chicago, because that tower away that back there, you see that's, uh, that's O'Hara Airport. She lives right next to the airport. Uh, over here is Kennedy Expressway. She has one tenth of an acre three times smaller than the average lot size in, in North America. It's a pretty one-tenth of an acre, uh, but she did the same thing. She, she got rid of uh, her invasive plants, put in 60 species of, of native plants, a water feature for the birds, and then she started to count her birds. And remember, she's not connected to any natural area at all. She's a tiny little island. And so far, she's recorded 120 species of birds that have used her yard, including a woodcock. There's Pam's woodcock. So if you haven't seen a woodcock lately, you can go to Pam's house in Chicago. But what about city centers? Though? What about city centers like New York? 82% of us live in cities these days. Are they going to miss out on all this fun? Well, in, in 2014, I was staring at this plant, Asclepias tuberosa. People call it a butterfly weed. Uh, but that reminds me, we've got a marketing issue with our native plants. We call them weeds. I wonder why people don't plant them. So let's not call this butterfly weed. Let's call it Monarch's Delight. Okay, 2014, I'm staring at Monarch's Delight. The first thing I saw were two species of leafcutter bees, a big one and a small one. Uh, and and leafcutter bees have very strict requirements. Uh, not only do they need pollen and nectar, but they also need soft leaves, leaves like uh, on, on red, red bud, because they cut the edges out of those leaves and leave these little semicircles. Maybe you've seen them. Roll up those, those uh, leaves stuff them in a hole, then pack them full of, of pollen uh, and close it up, lay an egg on it. And that is how they, they reproduce. Well, there was a, a red bud growing right next to Monarch's Delight. And I'm sure that's why the leafcutter bees were there. They had everything they needed. It's probably why there were bumblebees there as well, uh, because red bud produces a lot of, of uh, forage, a lot of, of blooms with nectar and pollen early in the spring. Remember, bumblebees overwinter as queens, which means they come out and they have no helpers. They have to do everything themselves. So in order to get that colony going, they need access to a lot of, of very abundant uh, pollen and, and nectar. And that's exactly what redbud supplies. And then I saw a monarch. Actually, I saw two monarchs foraging on Monarch's Delight. 
Now remember, this is 2014. 2013 was the low point in the monarch population in the East. Only 3.6% of the monarchs left compared to 1976. I had gone all of 2013 without seeing a single monarch. Uh, and this was June, very early for monarchs to be getting this, this far north. So um, I, I was excited. Maybe the monarch wasn't going to disappear after all. Why were they there? Well, they had, they had uh, monarchs delight, but there was another species of milkweed. I think it's purple milkweed. So they had everything they, they needed again. They had, they had nectar, but they had their host plant. They could reproduce. Do you know where I was? I was on the High Line in the middle of Manhattan. And you know the High Line. It's an elevated, uh, renovated elevated railroad, and they've got a strip of, of planting along the edge of that. It's about three feet wide. Um, largely, but not entirely native plants. There's the Monarch, Monarch Delight. 30 feet above the taxis, right in the middle of, of everything. This is Rick Dark. He was always after me to, to uh, go see the beautiful plants on the High Line. I'm not much of a city boy, I, I will admit. So I always drag my feet. Uh, but you know, going and seeing beautiful plants with nothing using them is actually depressing to me. So that's what I thought I would find, uh, but I was entirely wrong. Everything I just described to you, we saw in the first 20 minutes uh, and more. Somebody has done a, a survey of the native bees on the high line, they're up to 30 species. Uh, so. It convinced me that if thoughtful native plantings can bring life back to the middle of Manhattan, uh, we can succeed. We can do this nearly anywhere. But there are four things we need to think about if we're going to succeed in a big way. And one of them is we've got to shrink the area we've got in lawn. We've got more than 40 million acres of lawn nationwide, and that's a 2005 statistic. So you know we have more than that. Now, I know we need, we need, and lawn, of course, is an ecological deadscape. By the way, 40 million acres is the size of New England. It's, it's a big chunk of the U.S. that we have dedicated to lawn. And I know we need lawn to advertise our high status, and we need lawn to decorate our, our uh, Halloween, Halloween decorations with. Uh, but what if we turn this into this, as Dan Getman has done in, in uh, Northeast Missouri. This was a big lawn and he put in all these plants. In other words, what if we replanted half of the area that is now in lawn? That would give us 20 million acres to create a new park. And if we do it at home, we could call it Homegrown National Park. And it'll be bigger than the Adirondacks plus Yellowstone plus Yosemite, Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Mountains. But Edibola's Parks is still less than 20 million acres. So Homegrown National Park is going to be the biggest park in the country. What do you get when you put some part of nature right at home? Well, you get the opportunity to develop a personal relationship with that part of nature. And you can do it at your own time, your own pace. Get to know Mother, Mother Nature. You can avoid crowds. You know, if you go to a real national park these days, 375 million people did that last year. Um, it's pretty much a parking lot in a lot of those places. It's also free. There's no admission fee. It's never closed no matter what pandemic comes down the pike. No travel hassles. You get to experience the natural world alone. Uh, which I think is, is critically important. I don't know how you can develop that personal relationship with Mother Nature if it's mediated by, by somebody else. And this is really important for our kids. You know, our kids are suffering from nature deficit disorder, according to, to Richard Louvre. So we're trying. We get 30 kids and we put them on a bus and they, with a teacher. And they drive for an hour and they walk around a natural area for, for an hour. And the teacher tells them not to touch anything. Then they get back on the bus and they, they go home. And that's their experience with the natural world. But it's really been an experience with, with 30 other kids and a teacher telling them not to touch anything. If they have some part of nature right where they live, all they have to do is go outside and interact with it alone. No parental supervision. They will come home again. I guarantee it. Um, and maybe, you know why that's so important? Because our kids are the future stewards of, of the planet. And if they don't understand that they have to be stewards of the planet, how to be a steward of the planet. If they don't love stewarding the planet, they're going to be lousy stewards and we can't afford any more lousy stewardship. And maybe they will learn how to hunt lizards. I'm learning this from my, my own granddaughter, Zoe, who lives in 
Hawaii on a very modest patch of nature. It's a piece of lawn with a hedge, but there are anole lizards there. And when she discovered that, she sent me this picture to describe how you hunt lizards. You get on the ground and you cover yourself with leaves and sticks so the lizards can't see you coming. Then you crawl very slowly toward the lizard. No smiling, this is serious business. You can wear your best dress, that's okay. But you sneak up on the lizard, you catch the lizard, you put it in an aquarium, you learn how to take care of it. You develop a personal relationship with that part of nature. Now, I don't think Zoe's gonna be crawling on the ground in her best dress catching lizards the rest of her life. I don't think. She sent me this picture, so who knows. Uh, but I guarantee she's gonna remember catching lizards in Hawaii the rest of her life. And I also guarantee she's gonna be a good steward of the planet because of that. If you want your kids to do more than catch lizards, get Nancy Stranisti's Nature Play at Home. Gives you dozens of examples of how to expose your kids to the natural world right where they live. And if you want to join Homegrown National Park, no matter how small your yard is, you can become a member of Homegrown National Park. It is free. We're just, this is, this is our attempt to use social media to get the message that we need to turn things around. We need to reevaluate our, our relationship with nature everywhere, not just tree huggers, not just, just the choir, but everybody's got to get this message. So we want this to go viral. We want uh, enough people to uh, convert part of their, their yard to uh, native plants that are going to support their local ecosystem. So what you do is you go, you go to this uh, website, homegrownnationalpark.org, and put in your information. That's where you live and the amount of area that you are now protecting with native plants. And your little part of your county will light up, and you'll get to see who else is doing this near you. Um, we're gonna we're we're paying somebody to create the map so that you can see everybody who's on the map and see biological carters develop. Um, again, it's our attempt at social media to to get this grassroots uh, message. We've got a national crisis, but it's got a grassroots solution, and we're hoping this will be part of it. So we're going to shrink the lawn. What plants should we put in the area that was lawn? Well, some of them I'm gonna argue have to be what I'm calling keystone plants. Remember what uh, the, the keystone is? This is the Roman arch and this keystone is a stone in the middle of the arch. If you take that stone out of the arch, the arch falls down. Well, if you take keystone plants out of our local food webs, then the food web collapses because keystone plants are making most of the food. Just 75% of our, our native plants are, are, sorry, 5% of our native plants are making 75% of the caterpillar food that drives those food webs. 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillar food that drives those food webs. So think of the keystone plants as the two by fours and the ecological house that you're, you're building. They're essential to hold up that, that house. We've been trying to build ecological houses out of wallpaper and that does not work. Um, so the keystone plants are essential. They're not the only thing that goes in your house. You're not through building your house when they're there, but they are essential. So the question is no longer simply, are, are natives better than, than non-natives? On average, they certainly are, but there's a lot of natives that aren't all that, that powerful. Uh, the question really is, do we want to put the native species into our yards that are supporting the most pollinators and the most caterpillars? And I think the answer should be obvious. I get an email once in a while from somebody saying, don't you know that ginkgos, ginkgo biloba from Asia, actually grew in North America 7 million years ago? That makes them native. That means we can plant them and everything will be great. Well, yes, I do know that ginkgos grew in North America 7 million years ago. We can argue about whether that makes them native today or not, but I'm not going to have that argument because that's not the metric anymore. It's not whether they're native or not. It's whether they're doing anything or not. Are they supporting any life? I don't care if ginkgos grew in the moon 7 million years ago. They support zero species of caterpillars. So they're there, they're occupying space, but they are not supporting the life around them. What plants support more life than anything else? It's one of our oaks. In the mid-Atlantic states, 557 species of caterpillars on oaks, over 950 species nationwide. There is no other plant genus that comes close to that in terms of supporting local food webs. If you want to know what the keystone plants are where you live, anywhere in the country, go to Keystone Plants by Ecoregion from the National Wildlife Federation. Go to their website, uh, put in your, well, I don't even know if you put your zip code anymore, but you figure out what ecoregion you live in. <coughs> Excuse me. And the best plants, best woody plants and herbaceous plants for your county 
when, well, for, for your ecoregion will, will pop up, not just in terms of supporting caterpillars, but also in terms of supporting the specialist bees that, uh, that we need to support. When you put plants in, in your, your yard that support specialist bees, you're also support, supporting the generalist bees because they can use those plants as well. And goldenrods, asters, uh, the, the perennial sunflowers are the three best genera in terms of supporting specialist bees in many places in the country. Okay, we're gonna shrink the lawn, we're gonna put in keystone plants, we're gonna attract a lot of, of uh, insects to our yard, and then we're gonna kill them with our security lights which of course is not the goal. So a lot of research these days that is, is telling us that uh, light pollution at night is one of the major causes of insect declines around the world. These are all the ways that lights are killing our, our insects, particularly those important moths. But to me, this is good news. It's good news because we have to turn around insect decline. We've already lost 45% of the insects on the planet. That, that was as of 2014. And they're the things that are keeping us alive. We've got to stop that. And if we can do that by flicking a switch at night, we're getting off pretty easy. That's, that's pretty easy to do. But I know what you're gonna say. Uh, you can't turn that light out over your, your garage or over your porch because the bad man will come. Okay, put a motion sensor on it. So it only turns on when the bad man does come. And the first thing you're gonna realize is the bad man doesn't come very often. And if you don't want to do that, take the white light out of your, your uh, security light and the white bulb out and put in a yellow bulb. A yellow LED bulb is the best because yellow wavelengths are far less attractive to nocturnal insects. If we switched out our, light, our white bulbs with yellow bulbs overnight, we would save millions of insects and also millions of dollars because LEDs are much more energy efficient. Okay, we're going to shrink the lawn. We're going to put in keystone plants. We're going to turn out our lights. Then we're going to invite Mosquito Joe to come kill all of our insects. No shortage of, of ways that we, we like to kill our insects. Uh, this is a booming business around the country. Uh, Mosquito Joe is single-handedly undoing everything I've been talking about for the last 15 years. And he says it's okay because what he's fogging with is a natural product. And it is. It's pyrethroids. It's from chrysanthemums. Uh, but, you know, cyanide is a natural product, too. So I'm not sure that's a good argument. He also says it only kills mosquitoes, and that's not even close to true. I don't know if you saw the headlines last fall. Uh, big monarch kills as they were migrating. They flew through Mosquito Joe and hundreds of monarchs dead on the ground. This stuff kills all the insects it comes in contact with. Uh, but the, the real killer is, speaking of killing, it does not kill enough adult mosquitoes. In order to control mosquitoes in the adult stage, you have to kill 90% of them. Mosquito Joe kills between 10 and 50% of them. So he's not even close to being effective, which means he has to keep coming back and keep charging you. It's very expensive. If you want to control mosquitoes, you do it in the larval stage. Every homeowner can do this. Get a bucket. And people say, how big a bucket? I don't care. The bigger, the better. Fill it full of water, put in a, a handful of straw or hay, and let it ferment for a couple of days. Um, what you're doing is building up populations of diatoms and algae, and that is what larval mosquitoes eat. So adult mosquitoes, females, want to lay their eggs. They're really attracted to this brew you've just made, and they'll lay their eggs in your bucket. Then you go to the hardware store and you get a mosquito dunk. Nine dollars. You throw in, this is Bacillus thuringiensis. Throw in a disc. That is a natural bacterium that attacks uh, aquatic diptera. And the only aquatic diptera in your bucket is a mosquito larva. So it will, it will kill it in a very targeted way. If a dragonfly gets in here, it won't hurt it. If your dog licks it or a bird drinks it, it won't hurt it at all. Put a screen over the top though. So uh, a, a, uh, if a, a chipmunk comes by, it doesn't drown, jump in and drown. But if everybody did this, this would be a, a great way to get our mosquito populations down without killing anything else. Okay, the fourth thing we need to do is to landscape in a way that allows caterpillars to complete their development. What do I mean by that? Well, I live in Chester County, Pennsylvania, where oaks support 511 species of caterpillars. A few of them, like the polyphemus moth, complete their development on the tree. The caterpillar eats the leaves, then it spins a cocoon and hangs from, from one of the branches, then it emerges as an adult, and then it does it all over again. And I wish everything did that, but most species don't. 480 of those species, 
finish growing on the tree and then they drop from the tree and they wiggle their way beneath the soil and pupate underground or they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter that's under the tree. And that's the problem. There is no leaf litter under the tree. We don't tolerate it. And we mow and compact the soil around our trees uh, so that it's rock hard and our caterpillars can't get underground. So the way we landscape in so many places becomes an ecological trap. The moths come in, lay their eggs, caterpillars hatch, grow, drop down, and die. And I am convinced this is another major cause of, of insect declines around the country. And of course, the cement landscape is even less of a viable option. This is what most people do. You have a tree in a yard. We're just starting to measure how well these, these, uh, the caterpillars do in a situation like this. But I guarantee you they're going to do better in a situation like this, where you have a tree and then maybe a layered landscape, a dogwood, a native azalea, ferns, ground cover. This is a safe site. The caterpillars drop down. Uh, the land is not compacted. Nobody's going to step on them or mow them. Plenty of places for them to spin their cocoons. Survivorship will be much higher. This is where you can do your spring ephemeral gardening. This is how you shrink the lawn. You put beds around your trees. The bigger, the better. These are all safe sites. This is where you can use uh, uh, the native ground covers. There's so many of them. Things like wild ginger or foam flower or, or ferns, um, may apples. This is a hotel in Athens, Georgia. These are red maples and any caterpillar developing on these red maples can drop down and complete their development even though this is the middle of a city. So we can do much better in terms of supporting Caterpillar, uh, the completion of their, their life cycle by landscaping appropriately under our trees. Another graduate student, Desiree Narango, uh, has, has uh, done some wonderful work with chickadees in the suburbs of Washington, DC. And her results suggest that there's actually room for compromise in our plant choice. She asked the question, um, how well do, do suburban yards that are landscaped primarily with native plants support chickadee populations over time compared to uh, typically decorated landscapes with introduced plants? And the first thing she found is that the, the landscape with introduced plants uh, support 75% fewer caterpillars. So you reduce the amount of bird food by 75%. They were 60% less likely to have breeding chickadees at all. So the birds would come, their nest box is up there, but they would come and they'd look around and they say, there's not enough food here. We're not even gonna try to reproduce. If they did try, they laid 1.5 fewer eggs. Those clutches were 29% less likely to survive at all. Those nests produced 1.2 fewer fledglings and it took them 1.5 days longer to do that. When you put all that information into a population growth model, as a function of the percentage of woody non-native plants in your yard, from none to 100%. We looked at woody plants because that's where chickadees forage. This is what you get. The dotted line here is replacement rate. That's the rate at which the population has to make babies to replace the adults that die every year. If you, if you reproduce at that rate, um, you've got a sustainable population. It's not growing, but it's not shrinking either. If you make more babies than adults die, you've got a growing population. But if you make fewer babies, you have a shrinking, unsustainable population. And right here is where those, those lines intersect, generously speaking, which means you can have up to 30% of the, the um, plant biomass in your yard non-native without destroying your local, local food web, which means 70% of the woody plant biomass in your yard has to be natives. And if it's those keystone plants, that's even, even better. But this is the area of compromise I'm talking about. You can have your ginkgo. You can have your, your uh, Asian azaleas. You can have your boxwood. Anything that's not invasive. We can't tolerate invasive plants because they're ecological tumors. They just keep spreading and spreading and spreading. And you know what happens when tumors get in your body. It's not good. But we can have a lot of those other things. And that's good news to me. Because if, if uh, my message was you couldn't have any native plants any non-native plants at all, very few people would, would listen. Remember this? This is a ginkgo right here. Dan's wife really likes ginkgo. So it's in the landscape. Is it destroying this landscape? No, it's not. It's a much smaller percentage than, than the natives that are here. So it's not the presence of non-native plants that destroys food webs. It's the absence of native plants. If we get more native plants into the landscape, we can, we can tolerate many of these. Can we use uh, native plants in formal designs? Of course we can. This is a Lynn O'Shaughnessy uh, design taken by a drone 400 feet up. It's a big garden, but every plant in that garden is a native plant. 
Formality is a function of the design. It's not a function of the plants in the design. Our native plants are used in informal designs in Europe all the time. And I guess that's okay because they're not native plants over there. Can we get a pollinator garden into a, a yard like this without offending anybody? Of course we can put a little fence around it. It formalizes it. It tells, tells people that this is not a piece of, of the yard that you forgot to mow. It's not just a pile of weeds. Uh, it's not very big, but it is, is uh, providing uh, nutrition for a number of, of bees. And if everybody did it, it would certainly help out a lot. Remember why we need pollinators. The news will tell you we need them because they pollinate a third of our crops. That's actually about a twelfth of our crops. But I don't like that argument because people say, well, I don't live next to a farm, so I don't need any pollinators. You do need pollinators. They're pollinating 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. If we lost our pollinators, we'd lose 80 to 90% of the plants on the planet. And that is not an option. Where do we need pollinators? Everywhere we need plants, which is everywhere. How about, how about this? This is a uh, Drew Latham design, it's much bigger. Imagine the amount of life supported here versus the amount of life supported here. Seems like a no brainer. Can municipalities help us live with nature? Yes, they can and more and more of them are doing it. Minnesota has a cost sharing program called Lawn to Legume Program, where the state is paying homeowners to reduce or, or eliminate uh, their lawn, replace it with appropriate Minnesota prairie plants, very popular program. Pennsylvania has a lawn conversion program. It's not very old, only two years old, but you can get up to $5,000 per acre to convert uh, your yard into native planting. This was designed to help watersheds, but this is a perfect example of, of uh, you know, something that does two things at once. It helps the watershed, but it also helps the biodiversity in that watershed. Island off of Florida, they're paying homeowners to allow burrowing owls to burrow in the front yard. This is the way the Endangered Species Act should have been written with carrots rather than sticks. If you have an endangered species on your property, we're gonna pay you to take care of it, to be a good steward of that species, rather than fine you if you do something on your property. Everybody would want an endangered species on their property. Missouri and Fayetteville, Arkansas, uh, St. Louis, Missouri, I guess, had a, a uh, bounty on calorie pears. You take out a calorie pear, one of our most in invasive plants, and replace it with, they'll give you a free tree replacement if you do that. And water utilities are getting into the act, $100 coupons in San Antonio to people who put in water efficient native species rather than the, the thirsty non-natives. And of course the big lawn conversion programs in California up to $2 per square foot rebate for every square foot of lawn you, you uh, replace with xeric plants. California does not have one drop that they can share with, with lawn. I think we made three missteps in the early years of conservation. And this first one's a really important one. We've come to think of nature as if it's optional. We like it, uh, we like to visit it, but it's not essential. And if it's not essential, when push comes to shove, when resources are in short supply, which is always, then nature takes a back seat. I went to the Cincinnati Zoo before the virus broke out. And there's this wall size poster there, which to me epitomizes uh, our, our society's view of, of conservation. We need to save nature, save wildlife so that future generations can enjoy it. That was Teddy Roosevelt's argument for creating the national park system. We need to save these wonderful places so the future generations can appreciate them. And I understand that, but that suggests that nature there is just there for entertainment. Uh, it's, it's much more important than that. We need to save nature so that we have future generations, a little bit more urgent. We've also assumed that humans and nature cannot coexist. Now we talked about this, but if we only do conservation where there's not a lot of people, we're gonna fail because those places again are too small, they're too isolated, there's just not enough of them. David Qualman has a, a great analogy between a Persian rug and an ecosystem. That's a functional Persian rug, that's not 71 Persian rugs. That's 71 rug fragments, none of which are acting like a Persian rug. And that's what we've done to our ecosystems. The UN designates biosphere reserves as places of ecological significance. And I don't like that language because it suggests they're places on planet Earth with no ecological significance. Not so. Every square inch of the planet has ecological significance. Even our yards, even our corporate landscapes, even our roadsides, even our agriculture, 
just because we've destroyed it in a lot of places does not mean it does not have ecological significance. So we need to glue our rug back together again. We got to put the plants back, not just to build uh, biological carters that connect uh, existing habitat with each other, but to create viable habitat where we've completely destroyed it. And when we do this, we will be coexisting for nat with nature for the first time in modern history. Our third misstep was to leave Earth stewardship to just a few specialists, few ecologists, few conservation biologists. We did not see it as an inherent responsibility of every human being on the planet. But I don't know why, because every human being on the planet depends entirely on the quality of Earth's ecosystems. So why wouldn't everybody bear the responsibility of good Earth stewardship? The Western settler mindset, according to Stan Rushworth, a Cherokee elder was, I have rights. The mindset of indigenous people is I have obligations. You're not born with those mindsets, you're taught them. We are very good at teaching this one. We have been terrible at teaching our kids and our peers that we all have obligations to good earth stewardship. That doesn't mean you have to save biodiversity for a living, but you can save it where you live. And if you do, it empowers you. You know, the earth has big problems right now. A lot of people feel absolutely powerless. What can one person do? Well, one person can shrink their lawn, one person can turn out their lights, one person can put in a pollinator garden, one person can use keystone plants, one person can get rid of those invasive species that we didn't talk much about. Um, one person can totally revitalize the, the little ecosystem on their property and then enhance their local ecosystem instead of degrade it. And it also shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable for each one of us. Don't think about the entire planet's problems. You'll get depressed. Just worry about the little piece of the earth that you can influence. If you own property, that's obvious. That's where you start. If you don't own property, help somebody who does. Help a land conservancy, help a park or a preserve. They're all underfunded, they're all understaffed. They will love you as a volunteer. So as property owners or as volunteers, each one of us has the power. And we certainly have the responsibility to fix dead landscapes like this. Whether or not we decide to do so is gonna determine nature's fate and then ultimately our own fate. So I think I've convinced my, my grandkids that you are nature's best hope. I hope I've convinced you as well. Thanks very much.